Welcome to the RF Elements Unlicensed Podcast. I'm Caleb. We're joined here by Tassos, as always. Tassos, what's going on? What's happening, Caleb? Oh, man, this week we are having a conversation with Jeremy Austin from Proceem. So, really looking forward to it. He's been in the industry a long time, really understands a lot of the sort of background where a lot of folks are coming yep. from. Uh, and I think it's going to lead to a very interesting conversation. But before we launch into that, give the good people out there their call to action. Yeah, don't forget to like, listen, or subscribe to our channel right here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio podcast like Apple, Google, or Spotify. All right, all right. Well, let's go ahead and get to it. Jeremy, my man, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today and telling us about you, your history, uh, Wisp Life in general, uh, Alaska, Prasim, kind of whatever you want to talk about. This is an <laughs> open forum, and uh, we're just here to talk things out and see what's happening, man. So thanks. Thanks again. Oh, awesome, Caleb. And thanks to you, too. It's just going to be a really fun fun conversation. You know, one of the things we, we joke about uh, here in Alaska is, uh, you know, with Texans, right? Because because everything is bigger hey. in Texas. Hey. But our, our, our favorite one is, you know, one of these days we'll cut Alaska in half and then Texas will be the third largest state. <laughs> oh, God. This is going to set the tone for this entire conversation. Right. So. That's it. That's, that's, that's the extent of my, my Texas jokes. So. Well, he was he was picking me yesterday, and he was like, "Dude, it's already ninety five degrees here." And then I just got it's back terrible. from Ottawa at the Canwis thing last week, and it was, you know, eleven degrees that first day that we we're here. So I was very happy to be nice, temperate North Carolina. So I'm like, "Yeah, I'm not really tempted to, to hit any of these extremes here." So yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be like ninety three or ninety five today or something, and tomorrow will be back in the seventies. I mean, it's just. You know, Texas can't decide what it wants for weather, right? And they have the saying here, right? If you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. I mean, literally, it changes that quick. Yeah, I, I actually dropped by D Dallas on my way down to uh, Wisp America last month. And uh, that was uh, really nice, nice spring weather, uh, you know, like 65 or so. But I like, I'm in Anchorage now, and I really like the, the climate here. It's coastal, and so it's, it's pretty mild year round. Well, and this has been Old Man Weather Talk with RF Element. So it's been a great conversation, guys. We'll see you next week. So. But it is interesting. So living up there, uh, you know, you've done a lot of WISP type activities and stuff up there oh, yeah. in the area. You know, pretty much, as I understand, your whole life or a majority of your life. Up feels, there, so. It feels like it. Yeah. <laughs> so it definitely brings some interesting things into that conversation. We talked a bit uh, last uh, podcast with Chris Johnson about working in Montana and things like power and, and a lot of these sort of things came into play that a lot of folks just don't really understand, you know, the importance of it and where it comes into. But before we delve too deeply into that, if you give us kind of a quick rundown of your history, um, you know, from, from wherever you would like to start, I mean, we're definitely not starting at big bang levels, but you know, fast forward a bit to, uh, how you got in the industry, where things have gone from you and then kind of how, how you've gotten to be where you are now as the senior product manager at Prasim. Fantastic. Yeah. It's, it really is an interesting journey. Uh, you know, no one's journey is the same. And uh, it, it's been, I was just thinking back over on it as we, as we got this uh, podcast scheduled and I was actually thinking back to my, uh, my youth where my dad was a ham radio operator. So I grew up in Southeast Alaska. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, somebody holding up their hand uh, with the finger, finger pointing to the left to show the shape <laughs> of Alaska. Uh, so, you know, th this is the panhandle down here where the thumb would be, uh, you know, Anchorage is right here, kind of between the fingers. So I've lived, you know, I grew up down in the panhandle and I've lived in the interior of Alaska. And now I'm now I'm in South Central Alaska. Um, and I grew up on, on a farm on a very rural area on an island in Southeast Alaska. Hmm. So we did not have anything like commercial power. Uh, we would run a generator, but we would really just run that for daylight hours. So, you know, we could, uh, you know keep the lights on and keep the refrigeration running and then we shut it off at night. So being isolated from the outside world like that, we still consider that it was important to stay connected. And my dad became a ham radio operator and we strung up some, um, you know, some, you know, top, top, top some 80 foot trees in Southeast Alaska. It's a, uh, it's a temperate rainforest. The trees get very large and uh, you know, we'd, we'd climb them for fun. Uh, so you top a tree, put up some ham radio aerials and, um, and then be talking to, to folks in South America or, uh, you know, the East Coast or wherever, you know, you can do some really long range communication. So we still tried to stay connected with the outside world. 
by the time I got to, uh, you know, middle to late high school, the internet was just starting to be a thing. The web hadn't taken off yet, but there were, you know, like dial in access to the internet. Uh, all we had was the 900 megahertz uh, POTS extender. So I could do about 300 baud over that. <laughs> and I think I actually remember uh, hooking up a modem to a one of those bag phones really early on. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, having no connectivity really made me uh, uh, be excited to kind of get out into the real world, uh, you know, once I left home, but also gave me a real appreciation for uh, the needs of people in, uh, you know, rural areas or less connected areas. Uh, and uh, you know that's that's still my parents still don't have great internet. Unfortunately, I'm not a great kid because I I went at, I left home and and uh, started making internet for everybody else, not my parents. I guess we'll have to wait for Starlink. Shame for on them. you. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear that, that about every six months or so. My mom's like, yeah, internet stuff you do is really great. Could you get some of it down here? And I'm like, well, <laughs> one day we'll see. One day we'll see. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, went to college uh, in Canada. I actually got a degree in music education. Kind of my first career was as a music teacher. Hmm. And uh, but I never really did that more than more than part time. And in fact, when I when I left school, I went ahead and started doing web development because that was uh, that was 98 or so. So kind of web 1.0, you know, the big the big dot com boom uh, started doing web development and database development. Um, and uh, then a couple of years later, got into into uh, back into teaching, which is what my degree was in. So, um, so I kind of inherited a rural telephone company, uh, not 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 financially inherited, but you know the people who were managing it, they they saw this this young bright kid show up who you know wanted to learn what a punch down tool was, and they're like, oh, you can run this thing. <laughs> so, uh, I, I learned to learn to do you know copper telephony. Started doing point to point DSL fairly quickly. So those have been in the in the nineties, right? But we were we were still having to rely on um, like bonding dial up uplinks or bonding uh, uh, you know fifty six k circuits to actually bring uh, connectivity in. But then uh, you know in a rural campus you can run DSL anywhere you want, and I quickly started making. Uh, you know, village-wide um, uh, networks. And uh, from then, of course, wireless was a natural step. So the first, I was actually thinking back to the to the antennas. The first, uh, you know, kind of bootleg antennas I did were the original antennas. Uh, have you guys ever used those? I'm sure, right? <laughs> I have, definitely. I've made a couple of my, of my own, too. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody did. a long way. <laughs> it, was, exactly. it was a thing to do. As soon as we, we realized that, you know, all antennas, you know, don't have to be omni because that's what everything started. It's like, ooh, directional. That makes sense. You know, more power focused and stuff like that. So, yeah, that uh, that was definitely uh, an, an easy one that anybody could make for like a buck. <laughs> I remember the feeling of, you know, so there's a there's an access point in the office and I, you know, took the took the ATV and, you know, drove just a few hundred yards across the across the fields and aimed that thing back at the office. And I got a connection. I got a link. That was such a great feeling. Yeah. The first time you stripped down a wet 11, uh, put it in a little box or something, or the first sort of commercial link we did, it was, it was 20 miles on two, four, the 24 DBI grid. I think we got maybe a meg out of it. And we're like, we've revolutionized the internet. Like we'll never need more than this. And then <laughs> right. of course, then everybody started doing the same thing. And I was like, Oh, we can't shoot 20 miles anymore. Oh man, this sucks. So dot, 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 here we are. But I had a, I had an uplink, uh, you know, initial uplinks, you know, kind of in the in the pre Wisp era, or just kind of sort of the beginning of the Wisp era, were um, 802.11b. So I guess I guess we had people doing wireless before 802.11b. So um, you know, the, I, and again had a had a one meg connection to to half a T1, 10 miles away, and that was amazing, right? Yeah, it, it's 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 weird to see. I don't know. That's necessarily weird, but just uh, how bandwidth has changed and what was you know acceptable or considered great to where we are right now. And I, I think that the the expectation of uh, like needed bandwidth has grown far beyond the actual need of people as well. You know, I mean, uh, you have people now you know getting multi gig into their house and stuff like that, and it's like you know we're not anywhere near needing that kind of bandwidth. I mean, of course, there's the one off things, right? You know, if you're you know uh, a gamer and you you know you need to download you know two gigs or three gigs worth of uh, you know code. 
sure. I mean, it's nice to have, you know, a two gigabit connection and get it, you know, in, in a minute or two or whatever it takes, you know, versus waiting an hour. But I mean, that's just such a small minority of it. But back in the day when we had, you know, like a meg, which was probably 10 times faster than what we had before, you know, we could actually utilize that, that, that whole one meg and be like, wow, this is amazing stuff. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a huge disparity now between what's really needed uh, and, you know, what's being offered and, you know, you know, it really makes it difficult for a lot of the wisps in our space to kind of, you know, catch up and deal with that stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I don't like the direction it's going when it comes to that stuff. But I mean, this is how, you know, technology progresses. I mean, it'd be great. I mean, if we can get 10 gig to everybody all the time, you know, why not? But yeah, it's, it's tough. I do like that idea of future proofing. You know, that was one of the reasons sure. why eventually, um, you know, in the, in the, in the space I was working in, um, eventually I really did need to move to fiber for distribution, right? Um, the, there's an interesting point, if I can digress from my personal history for a minute, when you're talking sure. about that usage, you know, this, is, this really is a lot about the story, right? Uh, people, people are hearing advertising that says, oh, you need a gig or you need two gigs or you need 10 gigs. And while that very likely is true eventually, we look at you know 20% growth a year, it's still a few years out before the average person really can even begin to take advantage of that. Um, yeah. uh, we did some, some analysis at Preseam, uh, you know, my day job here, um, some numbers for CanWisp. And one of the interesting facts that we found out uh, from the most recent data, since of course it grows every year, we do have to keep it updated. And we put them out as industry reports, a fixed wireless report, for example. But one of the ones we've never put in the fixed wireless report is how much data do people use versus their plan speed? Mm -hmm. And we, because we find that, you know, the difference between a 25 meg plan and a 50 meg plan, it, it can make a difference in terms of what it feels like, particularly if you've got a bunch of people at home, but that doesn't necessarily make a difference in how much data is consumed. Uh, like a 50 meg plan user does not consume twice as much data as a 25 meg plan user. And we actually, because we also have data, not just from wireless, but from, from cable and fiber as well, we can actually extrapolate that line out on into the multi hundred 100 meg plans, you know, the gigabit plans. And what we're finding is that you have to go all the way to basically two, say a 200 meg plan, four times that 50 meg plan to double the usage. So it's like a four mm -hmm. to one ratio there. If we're trying to say, how much is this going to grow? You know, how, how future proof does my WISP need to be? Um, that line we're finding holds very steadily out, even if you're then migrating to something like fiber, which is going to have a, a much lower contention ratio. Yeah. I think also with, like you said, there's, there's the, the perception of how well it works. So I think with higher speed plans, you can also kind of mask at times some latency issues and stuff like that because you're, you're able to get so much more data in a smaller period of time. And this is, you know, specifically in wireless, right? Because it is very time sensitive. You only have so many slots. Uh, to transmit and receive data and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, the higher speed connections can translate into a better user experience. But I mean, I think if you compare those higher speeds on a poorly built network compared to say lower speeds on a very well-designed network where latency is traditionally low, you really wouldn't be able to see the difference except for those times when you're downloading a huge file and obviously you're, you're, you're limited to whatever the, the cap data rate is for that particular plan and stuff like that. But most people, most people never see it, you know? That's a hundred percent true. I would so much rather have, I mean, that's, I mean, we'll get to sort of like my mission and why I love being at pre -seam, but this is so relevant, uh, Tassos, yeah. where I would much rather have a connection that's a little bit slower and has much better latency than a connection mm -hmm. that's a little bit faster. In my, at my home, I'm, I'm connected to a WISP, uh, you know, after I spent, uh, uh, you know, 20 years or so managing that telco and moving it through all the all the generations of technology on up to, you know, microwave backhaul and, and lots of fiber distribution, as well as a little bit of wireless remaining. Um, I built uh, the Alaska's first LTE fixed wireless network that's still in production today. Uh, and nice. I worked at Alaska Communications for a couple of years. Alaska Communications is a tier two that has a regional presence through most of Alaska, which is geographically huge area compared to most WISPs, uh, as well as undersea fiber to the Pacific Northwest. And uh, Alaska Communications started getting into, uh, into wireless uh, back in about 2016 or so, 2017. And so the connection to my home here in Anchorage is uh, via fixed wireless, 
Um, and you know, a nominal, say nominal 100 meg connection. And I also have a 200 meg connect cable connection just as a backup because I do need to have a backup connection. Uh, since we, yeah, we, need we run all the, ex yes, you do. <laughs> we run all the experimental code on my connection. I need to make sure that I've got a backup, uh, you know, when we're, when we're doing firmware uh, testing, for example. And that 200 meg connection or 250, whatever it is on the cable is terrible because it's not actively managed. It doesn't have yep. good latency. As soon as you start saturating that upload latency tanks, I'm talking like multi-second latencies, crazy. Yeah, the experience is king. Yeah, I mean, I, and I've talked about it multiple times on this show, you know, my, my, my biggest experience with, you know, you know uh, having service from a WISP is, you know, out of my property, right? And, you know, <clears throat> I was paying, you know, huge amount of money, like, you know, close to a hundred bucks a month for a three by one connection, right? But I mean, I'll tell you that three by one connection was fucking solid. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I got three by one all the time. It almost never went down. I mean, honestly, it was very usable for, I mean, for what I needed, right? It's a weekend getaway. You know, the kids want to watch Netflix and stuff like this, but I mean, it was always there. And I mean, honestly, at, at home, right, I have cable internet and I don't even know what I have because when I when I got it right it was like you know 50 by one or something or by two whatever it was and I'm sure you know they, they they keep on purpose bouncing it up so it's probably like a 200 by something but but at times the internet at my ranch was a lot better and more consistent than the 200 meg connection I had from the cable company and as you know from today before we started this podcast you know the cable connection here you know bounced out and had to come back in as well so reliability is a is a, is a huge huge thing. And I, I definitely, you know, I, I don't know what that number is, but, but I, I think somewhere, you know, between, you know, 25 to 50 meg is, I mean, I would say satisfies the, the majority of what people use the internet for and especially the important things, right? I think that's, that's another thing. I mean, as a society, we've changed as to what's really important and what's necessary versus what's nice and convenient, you know, and you know, is gaming necessary? No, and I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, nobody should be gaming or anything like that. But if you think about the things that are truly important for, you know, your life in order to live it, you know, finance and everything is you need to be able to work from home now, obviously. Yeah. Right. So what kind of bandwidth does, you know, the average household, let's say even two stay at home parents that are working from home, not stay at home, but are working from home that are doing Zoom calls and stuff like that. It's like, what, five or six meg is probably enough for two of those streams, you know, and then, you know, casual browsing of the internet, right? So, I mean, really the, the, the need for what we need in order to live our lives and, 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 you know, do all the things that are important is, is really, really low <laughs> compared to, again, what's available. And uh, again, right. you know, I'm not going to turn away a 200, 300 meg connection if it's affordable and it's in my area. Why not? But I mean, I know I don't need it. And I, I, I just don't think most people know they don't need it. And I would like, you know, again, the consumers out there to just be a little bit more educated and, you know, you know what what really matters and, and what plays into a good user experience, because it all comes down to user experience. And Absolutely. it has nothing that typically has nothing to do with the speed of of, of your connection or, or less to do than you might think, you know, it's yeah, you can, better way of talk, putting it. Thank you. You talked a little bit <laughs> about the, you know, fiber or let's, you know, let's, let's talk about fiber equivalents like Millowave where you can, you can bandaid over the problem a little bit, right? You can, you can kind of push it out a little bit, but essentially anywhere you, anytime you have a bottleneck where, where the connection changes in speed, you know, from a 10 gig to a one gig or from a one gig down to a 500 meg plan or from a 500 meg plan down to the wireless in your house, you know how hard it is to actually get 500 megs on wireless, yeah. even with, yeah. with Wi-Fi six, it's pretty <laughs> darn hard. So, uh, you know, they, we, we've found at, at Preseam, obviously the best way to ensure that, uh, you know, that, both customers are happy and wish to keep making money is to really help people understand that problem. And we, you know, maybe we haven't done such a good job of, of educating the general public. This is something that FCC is starting, you know, in the United States, FCC is starting to, um, uh, to work on again with the whole broadband labeling thing. But even then there's a whole bunch of stuff that's irrelevant that customers don't really yeah. need to pay attention to. They really need, I, I'd love it if customers were demanding, I want a really great experience, both, you know, with that personal service that WISPs are known for. And I want to have this, be responsive when it's loaded up with a bunch of people in my house. Like I don't, I mean, some pe for some people, gaming is their job. Like I don't feel like gamers need to be discriminated sure. against, right? It's that, it's that it, a properly designed system can keep everybody happy, and that 
that's shocking news to some people. Yeah, definitely. And that's and that you brought up a, a really good point. And I think most of the WISPs that are watching this show would definitely agree if they were to look at their service calls and stuff like that. It's typically the you know the standard speed test, right? I'm not getting what I'm supposed to be getting. And and I mean, I don't have this data. It's just my gut feeling because I, I know I've, I've seen people. I have friends, right? And I see what they do because you know whenever they have a problem, who do they call? They call me, right? And they're like, I'm on my back patio, you know, with my cell phone running a speed test. I'm only getting. 10 meg what the hell's going on it's like my my internet sucks i'm like no plug into your router hardwire to are you see shooting what through a cinder block in. wall yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, most of most yeah. of them are it's like yeah i'm in the pool because my phone's waterproof i'm underwater and i want to watch a <laughs> video and i can't you know whatever it is and it's like i mean th- th- i think that's more of the education i'm talking about uh, obviously you know what's needed for certain uh, again certain tasks to get completed is one thing for things that you want you know considered enjoyment right you know uh, what would be entertainment you know gaming streaming videos and all the other stuff but also how it works in the house right because this this makes a a big a big difference on you know basically how wisps have to respond to these calls and it really could help it really could help because i think customer retention would would go up you know if, if people truly understand the difference between you know this is not my wisps problem this is you know d-link's problem for selling me a router with nine antennas on it that says it does you know one gig over the air you know at 160 meg channel but it doesn't work into the backyard you know because i right. have it in the closet you know yeah, that, that kind of stuff that kind plugged of stuff. up in the basement right next to the modem <laughs> and then it doesn't cover their three-story house and they're you know surprised so or under the tv you know in inside a cabinet under it's it's 100 percent a a a customer uh awareness problem really it is and and even the concept of the speed test like it's such a I, like I love Ookla. I love speedtest.net. They really give a lot of data back to the community. It's a free service. Uh, you know, don't want to don't want to trash speed tests or speedtest.net in general to, to name them specifically. But uh, but there's a lot more to the picture as we've been describing than than hitting a speed test. You know, it's one of the things I I kind of want to put the blame back on uh, on the modem and router manufacturers uh, in large extent. You know, you're talking about the 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 advertising claims, but then also the fact that like name name um, you know a router that really gives you a real time picture of what's going on in your network from a quality of experience perspective. I mean, many of them will give you some reports. I love Plume. I got Plume at home. It's a mesh network, and uh, you know I've, I I do have an app that lets me know what's going on in terms of total bandwidth consumed. But even to go back to our our point about like how much data do people use on a plan. That's not actually as important as how does it feel when it's busy, right? How much you're using in total is very seldom under your control. Like if you are a gamer, maybe you can schedule an update when that occurs. You say, oh, this thing's going to be 160 gigs. But even if you've got your iPhones, you know, it's going to be that that download may be configured to run in the background at some point. And you don't have any control over when that happens. And, you know, you're you don't have any visibility into like... What's actually going on? You know, I love I love routers that have some kind of display, but nobody's really put on it like this real time graph. Here's your, here are your devices, and here's how much bandwidth they're consuming, uh, and and what they're doing. You know, it's a it's a hard problem to solve from a user interface perspective. But I kind of I kind of think it's uh, on the on the router manufacturers. They haven't had an incentive to do it. Yeah, but it's also like you know how many people are actually going to use that information and do anything remotely coherent with it. So you know the techie folks and and our sort of circles we run with would, but you know for most people if they're not using the the, the modem or the AP that's built into their cable modem or whatever, they go down to the Best Buy or the Wally World and be like, okay, this thing's a hundred, this thing's a hundred and twenty. Ah, this one must be way better, right? Because it's twenty bucks more. Chuck it in default settings, no firmware updates or anything like that. So. But yeah, you know, and there are some of these, I think, more tech sort of like the Amplify, uh, you know, they've got some graphs and displays and right. stuff, you know, because they're they're angling more towards that sort of gamer market or, you know, the upper, you know, the, the consumer sort of tech market of things. So I, I think we are seeing more of that. But I mean, just to your point. You see so many issues and support things that are, are related to that. You know, hey, I can get my speed. And this could either completely saturated because you've got like four 4K streams running in the back that you don't realize are the internet. Uh, or it's this ratty AP problem and stuff. So, 
you know, if there was some sort of way to show that, it'd be amazing. I just, I don't know how it would could do it in a cohesive manner for a, a very non-technical database or customer base that most of these are going for. That's a really good point. And, and that's also why, you know, like at Preseam, you know, we really just to focus our efforts on the provider because we figure if the provider has the tools that they need, then there's they're still that interface with the customer and they can help the customer understand. And there, there has been a big shift in the WISP market towards moving towards managed AP platforms. One, so you can control the hardware, you can control, you know, at least the quality of what you're, you're putting in the house. But that managed service giving you insight as to the connection behind the wall, behind the CPU. I think is where the market has really shifted over to the last few years. You know, we've seen Cameo has been pushing up for a while with their pilot. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Calyx has gotten really popular lately, but now we're seeing a lot of these newer sort of pop-ups, uh, Velo. Uh, TP-Link has really gotten into the space and has really gotten popular. And I think that's the next sort of big movement from a, a quality of experience perspective to the end user customer is the management of that. Um, but you've got to pay for it, right? Like this is all great stuff, but it's never free. So then you've got to weigh the, you know, is this worth it to me in the long run to reduce the support? Yeah. The same sort of things you guys hear about plenty, I'm sure. So, yeah, that no, that's a very good point. I, I think back in 2016, when I was building that, uh, LTE network, I said, you know, this is the future. It's going to be managed. And we just went managed entirely from day one. Uh, it said, you know, it's going to be just price that in, factor that into the price and, uh, and do it. Don't even do it as an add-on. And, uh, and, and you're definitely seeing, you know, the Calyxes, the AdTrans, the TP-Links. Um, Plume has been a huge success story. If you look at, you know, their, their penetration in the market, you know, they've got to be well over 25 million uh, in the U.S. alone. You know, that's a, that's a really big chunk of what is a pretty fragmented market otherwise. Uh, and mm-hmm. it really does come down to that. Well, let's get the experts who can look at it uh, to, to pay attention to it. Uh, you know, the, the end user, give the end user enough control uh, and enough data so they can understand, you know, is it healthy or not? And it's, it's hilarious that we're seeing, uh, you know, within, within just a few months uh, time, we're seeing the release of this idea of scoring that customer experience, give, just give a number, <laughs> right? We're seeing it. We've seen it from Calyx. We've seen it from, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the, the other one that we saw from recently, uh, an, an operator, um, uh, you know, a, a home router vendor. And of course, with Preseam, we brought out our, our RF analysis features uh, just before Wisp America. And that certainly wasn't something that we did in a month. You know, I came to Preseam at the end of uh, at the end of 2020. And, uh, you know, it took us, a, you know, from then until now uh, to really get that to market. So uh, apparently, apparently great minds think alike, right? Everyone's, everyone's <laughs> doing the same thing at the same time. It really focusing on that customer experience. Right. Well, I think it's the next sort of major competitive thing. And especially with Wisp is so important because, you know, when years ago when you're like, Hey, this is your only option, you know, here's your half meg. It works as well as it works is all we can deliver because, you know, that's what the tech can do and the size of the networks. But now as networks get more dense and as you can honestly compete with your cable codes, your fiber codes and stuff like that in terms of speed and performance. Now that the end user, the field just all goes into the sort of customer service aspect of things. So I think that's where we're seeing a lot of focus, or at least in our industry, moving towards that as well, because it's just yet another competitive uh, thing that they can offer that, you know, your Comcast and your Spectrums don't give to your ass ass about. So I want to ask a question for you guys. Um, so the, obviously the six gigahertz spectrum is not not fully open, but I, you know, I did an analysis of how much spectrum is available to us. And to me, this really looks like a game changing amount of spectrum. Like you're, you're, you're going to be selling a lot of antennas, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's huge. It's huge. I mean, it's I mean, depending on where it goes, but I mean, it's it's practically. I mean, it's split between the indoor and outdoor, right? So I'm not quite sure exactly how much uh, is available, but I mean, it, it's about a gig, right, worth of bandwidth that's available for indoor and out, and that's really what we're waiting to hear. Uh, is you know what's that final number? What's really the outdoor, uh, you know, band? Because you know when it comes to making antennas, I mean. We can make wideband antennas. I mean, our five gig are pretty much five to six, right? So one gig wide. But if you if you know uh, that the uh, uh, the you know operational bandwidth is smaller, 
um, then you can make a much better antenna if you tune it specifically for that more narrow band and get even better performance, maybe even more gain. Um, and, you know, purposely, like for us to go and, and just make a six gig antenna from six to seven, you know, wouldn't really be the right thing to do because, again, if we wait just a little bit longer, we can tune it to, let's say, whatever, you know, 6.1 to 6.5 or something like that and get much more performance out of it. And I think, uh, you know, it, we see it with other manufacturers. They try and go as wide as possible to cast the widest net to catch the most customers without really, you know, from what I say, they don't really care about the experience uh, that the customers will see. They just want to sell antennas. We want to make the best antenna right. and give our customers the best user experience. And that's that's why, um, you know, it, it's really important to wait for some of this stuff to get hashed out so that way we can deliver the best possible product. Now, you know, our antenna is already designed, right? So we right. kind of know where it is. So it's it's a matter of you know you know designing them you know in the design tool, right? You know coming up with the shape, the size for all the different things. You know we we can have a you know from six six to seven gig, and if we know we, we might make a six one to six five or whatever on the higher side, whatever it is, and then you know once it's time to go to manufacturing, it's time to go to manufacturing, right? So I mean those designs you know are done ahead of time, and uh, we just fine tune it. Right? Right at the end and then we go to production so it should be it should be fairly quick and you know of the offering we already have all of our symmetrical beam antennas right which would be all of our symmetrical horns obviously um, but then our ultra horn and even our ultra dishes right the parabolic dishes are symmetrical beam meaning that they're just as wide as they are tall in that rf pattern they already go up to 6.4 so for a lot of the uh you know test radios that are coming out and 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 uh, some of these pre test licenses that are out there for 6.1 to 6.4, our antennas are ready to rock and roll as it is. So um, it's really the asymmetrical antenna that was a very difficult task to get the performance uh, we get out of our asymmetrical horn compared to other ones on the market is just night and day difference. And, uh, you know, it was very difficult to get that whole one gig from basically 5.1 to 5.9 almost, whatever it is. Um, and it stops at six and still maintain that flat gain across the entire spectrum, that uh, balance beams with a vertical pattern and a horizontal pattern pretty much overlay almost exactly on top of each other. And uh, again, because of you know the shape of that beam pattern, it really requires uh, a lot of engineering to get it to play well um, uh, in, in that frequency range. So really that's, that's probably the one uh, that will take the most work in order to get it to be wherever that you know, you know, Wi-Fi six spectrum will be for outdoor to make sure it's tuned. The symmetrical one should be fairly, fairly easy to to get uh, to work up there and stuff. Well, there's also a non-zero chance that the FCC doesn't screw this up completely too. Yeah, it's kind of funny, exactly. like because you know we're waiting on the AFC and everyone's like, "Cool, all we need is the AFC, then we're done." And it's like, well, you know, if you look at some of these experimental licenses and STAs that are going up and people are testing, and you read through the nitty gritty, you know, it's very clear there's a 36 dBm EIRP, which we all kind of know about. But if you read closely, the max EIRP of your uh, antenna, your max gain in your antenna, is still listed it is 6 dbi so yeah 36 right. erp but only 6 db dbi excuse me on your antenna which if they sort of stick with that and don't change it to be flex like they do in five gig now or you know similar to two four or something then uh we're all going to jump off a bridge so <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean and that's <clears throat> that's that's the other thing too because i mean a, a big portion of what Wi-Fi 6 brings is 4096 QAM, right? And we already know now with 1024 QAM uh, in the regular 5 uh, gig band, uh, practically every radio out there, I think, for 1024 QAM has a maximum TX power of about, you know, let's say 18 dBm or something like that in order to maintain that modulation rate. Now, when we go to 4096 QAM, because again, that modulation rate is, is very, uh, it's a very difficult technique to disseminate, you know, the constellations and stuff like that and, uh, you know, get the data out of that, uh, you know, that, that RF signal. I mean, I, I would imagine, I mean, it's it's probably, you know, well, 1x lower, right? So we're probably looking at these radios when they come out of 4096 QAM being a max uh, 
you know, TX power of maybe about, you know, 15 dBm. So if you put 15 dBm, yeah, exactly, exactly. So 15 on the TX power and six on the antenna, you know, we're, we're, we're below, almost below the, you know, the DFS, uh, you know, total, total power output and stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, the, the radios will be so, so deaf on the receive side with that little gain, which, you know, again, uh, th- that's that's really something I'm waiting to see how all that hashes out because it's really been something that we've been talking about for a while with, you know, you know, shrinking the, your coverage area, right? So, I mean, the industry is finally moving and realizing you need to get your customers closer uh, to your towers and stuff. Well, when Wi-Fi 6 comes out and people are going to, you know, they're going to want that full, you know, 160 meg channel, which is yet even lower TX power, right? Um, at, you know, 4096 QAM, I mean, we might be talking distances of, you know, a, a mile or two max, you know, with, you know, dish antennas on the CPE side of, you know, probably 30 DBI minimum, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, there's going to be a, a, a lot of, uh, education that's going to need to be done. And, and we're starting some of that now to really let people know and, 1024 qualm you know the uh, the uh, LTU from ubiquity uh, does 1024 qualm and I believe like the 4000 or the 400 Good. series now from yeah. cambium is doing 1024 qualm as well that that shrunk it even more so at 256 qualm I mean this is like the kind of general rule of thumb right so you know at 64 qualm right which is 802.11 n the, the the standard radius 10 miles right was pretty much what it is 256 qualm came out you have it, right? You know, because it's 3 dB less, basically. It's it's roughly about five miles or something like that. Again, it depends on the CPE. Uh, you can go further and stuff. At 1024 QAM, you know, we're at like two to three miles max. And when I say right. max, it's with a, a decent, you know, acceptable size antenna on the CPE side, because that's really what it comes down to. So I don't know how many, you know, uh, customers out there are going to want three foot dishes on their on their house. Now, I, I, we've talked to many Wisps and they already do it. You know, even Chris Johnson, right? He's putting three foot dishes out there because, you know, in order to get, you know, four miles or something like that at, and get that 10x connection on an LTU, you need a three foot dish, right? So, man, uh, you know, we, we might be talking four foot dishes on people's right. houses. So, so there's really... Uh, a, a lot needs to <clears throat> a lot needs to happen um, and uh, people really need to understand because you know at some point you know this this uh, six gig stuff at 4096 qualm almost has the same effective range as as 60 gig at this point right. you know probably gonna it's gonna have much better rain attenuation specs right so that's so at least you might get that you know two mile or less but it doesn't matter if it rains type of connection where you know with 60 gig yeah you know you know on, on a perfect day with no humidity yeah maybe you can go two miles with it but you know as soon as it you know the humidity goes above 50 percent you know things drop down and and start to fall off so so i i feel confident in the six gig that the connections regardless of weather and not 100 percent regardless obviously you know torrential downpours and everything else you'll have a pretty repeatable and a pretty consistent, you know, deployment distance uh, for that kind of gear. But it's it's going to be another wake up call because again, this the stuff is growing faster than you know Wisps can build out their networks in order to you know put those towers up closer to their customers. So it's going to be interesting. It's really going to be that's hundred percent true. Yeah, we we estimate uh, between seventeen and twenty percent comp- compound growth year over year. Is what we've seen steadily, and in in what other industry can you be expected to lay down, you know, twenty percent more uh, more water pipe or twenty percent more roads? And uh, you know, so in this case, like you could take the gains either with a twenty percent improvement bump, but you don't even get a twenty percent improvement bump going to ten twenty four qualm, let alone fourteen ninety six qualm. I think people. I'm glad you the, mentioned that. <laughs> they have this imagination that oh, it sounds like it's four times as big as ten twenty four. No, yeah. it's single digit percentage improvements. You yep, know. yep, exactly, exactly. The jump from you know two two fifty six qualm, which is your your prisms, your EPMP three thousand, those type radios. It's it's I think it's yeah somewhere between twenty and thirty percent more throughput for you know you know it's four times the modulation. But I I call it doubling, right? You go you know two fifty six goes to ten twenty four goes to forty ninety six, um, is yeah it's essentially. Like I said, twenty or thirty percent more throughput. It's really about the larger channel sizes 
you know, in these newer radios that, you know, deliver really these, these higher data rates that everybody's talking about. But I mean, shit, you know, uh, Wi-Fi 6 is going to get trashed the day it comes out almost, you know, if everybody's running 160 meg channels, hopefully, hopefully people learn and they're not, you know, deploying these things with sloppy sectors and stuff like that with lots of side lobes and right. creating all these problems. I mean, I can go back about three years ago or something like that. When 60 gig, maybe it's two years ago, 60 gig was, you know, coming out, it was fairly new and everybody kept talking about these pencil beams, you know, well, the beam is like a pencil, you know, there's no whatever. And, you know, it's such short range and attenuates so fast. We didn't ever have to worry about noise. I'm like, dude, trust me, it's going to catch up with you. There's no way that it won't. And here we are, you know, two plus years later and people are like, wow, I mean, I have a noise issue, <laughs> you know, with my 60 right. gig stuff because again, it's limited spectrum. They're running the, the widest channels they can. They're putting them so densely together because you have to, because the coverage areas are so small and it's creating, it's creating, it's creating big problems. So when you go to a lower frequency, which propagates even further, I mean, geez, uh, you know, we, we have to be smart as wisps when deploying these networks and, and, and truly start engineering this stuff. Now, hopefully, you know, the SAS and everything helps, you know, so we don't oversaturate areas and control some of that stuff, but that's going to be, Again, that's going to be even more interesting. It's it's almost like the the whole thing will be like DFS, you know, and people are going to be bouncing channels and jumping around. And I, I don't know. I don't know how that that's truly going to work. Uh, you know, if somebody comes into your area and wants to fire stuff up, I mean, will they just get denied a license? No, you know, no, or, or, or you know, nothing right. to do with that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean. Yeah, it's, it's going to be the Wild West. It's really going to be running out there, grabbing as much land as you can, as fast as you can, sticking your flag in the ground and saying, this is my Wi-Fi 6, <laughs> you know, right. and, be, and be the first first one out there is really what it's going to be like. And and I'm afraid that, again, you know, uh, Wisps will, will run out and, you know, maybe run, you know, powers they shouldn't, who knows. And, you know, in order to cover an area, they might try and go with the widest sectors they can to just, you know, again, not put this huge capital expenditure to build these dense networks like they do now with horns in, in the five gig area and start doing them with, you know, more wider sloppy sectors just to be the first one out there and start creating problems from the beginning. I, I, I truly hope that doesn't, it doesn't pan out like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I completely agree about the need to engineer it. And this is, that's one of these things that uh, I, I can remember in the early days of when I was getting into wireless where, uh, you know, wireless engineers were, were mad that Ubiquity Gear was available, right? Because <laughs> it meant that anybody could go slap up a power beam yeah, and start polluting yeah. the airwaves. So, which on the one hand, it's a great democratization of the technology. It really allowed Definitely. people, allowed myself, allowed other people to, to, you know, really serve their local communities. You know, I wouldn't have had internet if I hadn't run run some ubiquity yeah. gear, right? I, I had to do it myself. That's how I, like so many of us, that's how we got into the business. You know, we would we would have been stuck without it. And then you find yourself realizing, oh, now I need to actually learn about this. You know, there is no free lunch. Eventually you start saturating your spectrum or you start dealing with self-interference. And I think that's one of the things that's ideally self-correcting about the people who are running illegal power levels. Just those power levels are there for a reason. You know, we don't, uh, we don't collect that data at pre-same, so I can't give you any hard statistics on it. But uh, we encourage people to to run whatever whatever regime they're in to to run yeah. legal power levels, because uh, really, ultimately, you're the one who's going to suffer the most. I, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely think. Again, you know, not to beat Wi-Fi six up, you know, here, but it's really going to all come down to education. Um, you know, you brought up a good point. I mean, I, I remember uh, when Ubiquity came out and everybody was, like you said, they were pissed because it was so cheap. Anybody can start a Wisp and stuff like that. And it, it really, it really wasn't. I mean, it seemed like now anybody can come in and start this business. This should have been a special business, blah, whatever. But it was really about the education of the people that were coming in. Ubiquity made it so easy. And they did a horrible job, or actually no job at all, of educating their customer base on how this stuff works. And therefore, they went out and, and built illegal networks you know, with, again, you know, too much power and uh, the wrong antenna technology to, to make you know, you know, all this noise and, and, and you know, the other things that came along with that. So it really wasn't about you know, uh, opening up the markets to entrepreneurs to build businesses. That was fantastic. And I give them full credit for that. That was amazing to come in and disrupt the industry and 
and make it affordable for for people to start these businesses and stuff. But they they did a shit poor job of you know educating the users on how this stuff should be used and used properly. And uh, for six gig, it's really gonna it's gonna take that again. I mean, it's really gonna require education. And you know, I I remember hearing when the you know Air Fiber 11s and was it the the B11 and I think there's is there a B18 now from Mimosa? Do they have an 18 gig? But when that when that stuff first came out, it was the same exact thing. People are like, damn it, now they're making it so easy that anybody's going to have a license link. And you see it now, it's hard to get licenses because everybody's, you know, putting them up. And and that is the right thing to do. I mean, we right. have to we have to get our backhauls off of the unlicensed spectrum and onto licensed stuff, but it creates a whole nother problem, you know, by making it affordable, more people were doing it, which was, again, it was the right move, but I mean, right. it's, it's getting thrown up everywhere and it's, it's making it difficult to get licenses. So I, I think that, you know, at some point that's going to be the, the next thing, you know, the E-band stuff I think is going to be perfect for this, you know, for Wi-Fi 6 networks, uh, because again, the towers should be closer to each other. So making those backhaul connections that are two to three miles or something like that and, and and transferring, you know, high throughput, you know, from tower to tower is going to require that type of equipment. So that's, you know, it's going to be great for companies like Aviat and, you know, everybody else out there that are making these or, things. Or even in um, the point to multipoint stuff, Tassos, yeah, with yeah, the, yeah. like, I would love to see products that, that pair 60 with some horns, right? Where you can fail over to, let's say that you've got, uh, you know, kind of some opportunistic uh, opportunistic six, you know, it, mm-hmm. it'd be a fantastic pairing. That's one of the things that I, I think we're going to see just multiband in general. Uh, we're going to see some growth there because there, there really is no one size fits all spectrum for any, any circumstance, any, or even antenna, right? Yeah. Uh, we've, yeah. we've gotten, we got away with for a while, but look at what the cell industry is doing. They're bonding all kinds of channels together because they realize you got to do that. You know, you, there is no one, there was no one band or one antenna that's a, the holy grail. Um, if I can, if I can talk a little bit about what I've been doing at Preseam, because uh, this is really relevant here. When you talk about this education problems, let's talk about the, uh, the let's explore this sort of, uh, it's not strife exactly, but this, um, uh, this, challenge that vendors have in both educating their operators how to use the gear and the operators saying hey you you made the gear that i could turn up to illegal power levels or whatever the case may be you know that's kind of an extreme case of what i'm describing but uh, we talk about at Presame, you know the the vendor has a spec sheet and the radio should match the spec sheet right it says, yeah. okay, this was, and, and they generally do. You know, they have to go through, F, in the United States, they go through FCC certification process. You can trust those numbers, right? However, those are all dependent upon how the operator deploys it. You've got to put the right antennas on it, right? You've got to understand that signal is, ba- uh, you know, the modulation is based on SNR, not on receive level. Right, because mm-hmm. they don't usually publish those numbers. They publish the receive levels, but that's assuming a virtuous noise floor, right? So, uh, you know, I, I saw the extent of this problem uh, both at Alaska Communications, where we were dealing with, um, uh, you know, gear from a particular vendor, uh, where it wasn't always even possible to tell from the vendor numbers exactly how <laughs> this equipment was doing. Like what we were seeing in terms of real world performance wasn't match. It wasn't just a case of it not matching the spec sheet, because I don't think that was true. It's really that if you don't deploy it correctly, if you have an education problem internally, let's say that, or you're say you're a startup WISP, um, which in the case of of you know many of the people that I've worked with, they've um, you know gotten into it without having RF uh, experts on staff, right? And I don't even consider myself an RF expert. I just think about it, right? I realize yes. I've learned from my mistakes, and I think about it, and I go talk to the people who I know are RF experts, right? So I said, you know, we need a we need a system that really lets the operator know how well the equipment is doing at the RF layer without you know not 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 shortcutting this learning process you know very often we see the the, the you know folks like your your you know yourself to us where you you have this gut understanding of the difference between efficiency as you change modulations and these ranges you know they're in your heads but you know to to a to a new guy starting out he isn't going to have any idea about this he sees the spec 40 kilometers i can do it right <laughs> and it's all the if if you do X, if you do Y, with the right antennas, with the right environment, and you know, and, and clean weather, and the corn fade hasn't, corn hasn't grown up, you know. Uh, so what I did is, uh, you know, with the with the help of the folks at Preseam, uh, we've built a system which 
which is essentially scores every piece of RF equipment that you've got and says, here's nice. how, it, how well it is performing. And, it's, and we do that based on how well, uh, how well it's performing based on real world performance from our entire global database of, of operators. So we can tell you, this is what you should be able to get out of this equipment in a real world deployment, right? Where you've got some noise maybe, or maybe you're in a coastal area where you don't have any competitors. You've got no noise at all. You know, you'll be able to see that too. Uh, and that allows you to very quickly t tell, you know, what do I need to pay attention to most on my network? And as an expert, you can look at it and say, okay, let, I'll look at a, I'll look at, you know, a two week graph or whatever, and I'll get some idea of, okay, you know, that's, that's fluctuating more than I expect, or that's lower than I'd expect for this time of year and this level of rain. Uh, you know, you, you can get a gut sense for that, but then you got to know the channel width, you got to know the frequency band, you know, all these, the timing parameters, all these things you have to have in your head. <clears throat> so we make experts faster because now they can look at the gear and immediately see objectively how, how well is this piece of equipment performing. And that's the part that's essentially under the operator's control. So with that data, not only do you know what do I need to go fix on my network, but then we also include the uh, the user behavior side. So that that side's all separate from user behavior, the the end user behavior. Then we then when we take the user behavior into account, we talked about that usage, uh, you know, peak usage at <clears throat> on a 50 meg plan is going to be higher than 25 meg plan, but it's not by twice as much. You can't just look at total volume of data. You got to look at what's the the burden that that user is placing on the network. One of the things I like to say is uh, we customers buy bits from us, but what we actually sell them is airtime. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what you guys of RF Elements have done is educated people to say, you got to preserve your airtime. You got to get your modulation rates up. You got to get your sectors clean. You got to cut down on those side lobes. It's been a tremendous education job that you guys have been doing. And we're kind of showing now the other side of that. Here's, here what, here's what you're actually getting out of the equipment now that you've deployed it. This is under your control. Combine that with the, um, the user behavior. And now you can immediately see what kind of ROI am I getting? What equipment do I need to go fix first to, to, to free up airtime uh, if that's customers in the field? Ideally, to, to, to reduce needing to do a truck roll. So we consider that to be part of the umbrella of quality of experience uh, you know, that we're, we've been known for at, at Preseam where we're you know, measuring latency and loss. But now we're actually telling you how is it performing at, at layer one and uh, the operators are really appreciating that. Yeah, especially, you know, when, when you're with startup and you get past the sort of freshman year issues, like just trying to figure out how do I put this on a roof and how do I do that? Like eventually get to the point where like, hey, this seems to be working. We're happy. But are we? And then, then you kind of move that sort of sophomore year where you're like, well, yeah, it's going, but we, we don't really know how to judge. You know, we can look at a specific data point and see if it's OK, but or you're always chasing it. Yeah, exactly. You're like, hey, this a you know, I haven't had any complaints about this AP for a month, and now I'm getting a lot. And why is it? Because I mean, it's on, and people are still connected. But you know, it's that yeah. deeper insight I think that leads to uh, a lot of the value proposition of, of what you're talking about. For and sure. that, so that that's really percent. cool. Like if you if you do nothing, like this is one of the rare industries, I suppose, where if you do nothing, it's going to get worse because people are going <laughs> to use more. Like just, you got to, it's like uh, Alice in Wonderland or Through the Looking Glass, where she's with the Red Queen and they're uh, on the chessboard and they're they're running running as fast as they can and they end up in the same place. This is you have to run faster than that to get ahead, right? You're it's this constant battle, and that's what we're hoping to uh, operators, as you say, it, it's definitely a kind of a year two problem where you you start to scale up and you start to have parts of your network that are congested and you say, okay, am I, am I actually getting the ROI that I need from, from, from that equipment? Because you, you, you know, you, you can only do so much as a favor for so long. And then eventually you have to make sure that you've, you're, you're building, as you said, get closer to the end user tasks that you're talking about with, uh, you know, making your cell sizes smaller, everybody's having to go through the same pain. And we just hope to optimize that uh, to, to just cut that pain down as much as possible. We can't eliminate it, but let's just yeah. make it as easy as possible for you to make the best decisions about your network. Yeah, definitely. And this, I mean, this is where things are actually getting better. And, and, and I mean, social media, you know, the one thing that it's really good for is, you know, sharing ideas and stuff like that. And where it's where it's really, really helping, because, you know, in, in you know, a few years ago, you know, we'd constantly see, you know, customers going out, you know, building these networks with no forethought and, uh, you know, really no, no idea, because maybe they didn't have, you know, a place to get all the information. And, and I see a transformation happening where 
where we have more wisps, you know, coming to us, let's say, you know, building their networks with our horn starting off. How do I do it right and, first? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's something we always said, like, uh, you know, a lot of people would be like, well, yeah, you know, I, I don't need your antennas, whatever. I'm, I'm in a rural area. I'm the only guy out here and I got no noise. And like, we'll give it time, you know, noise will find you. And, you know, then, you, you know, a year later, they're coming back and like, well, you know, these things aren't performing very well. And so, so, so new wisps are, are seeing earlier on that you need to build it right from the start because it's going to be you know uh, less of a forklift later for you to fix those problems so that's that's the good news coming out of this and uh really the benefit of education and, and I, I wish you know more manufacturers would you know hop on board and 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 do this kind of thing to educate the user base out there because uh, again you know if, if we want to say relevant as an industry we have to make sure that uh, you know we're 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 building these things right from the beginning, uh, and we're teaching the new blood coming in because I, I love the new blood. You know, I, I want to see yeah. more people building wisps, but they have to do it right. And 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 I've kind of, you know, uh, you know, when when a wisp goes out there and builds a bad network, it's really not just hurting them, it's hurting the other wisps. Because I've talked to so many other people that have been like, oh, you got that wireless service, that shit is crap, you know? I'd never do that because they were in an area and they had a wisp who didn't know what he was doing and he built a crappy network and therefore it just puts a bad taste in their mouth. So we have to change things around, right? Uh, you know, I, I think the the big telcos, and you know, the Verizons, AT&Ts, T-Mobiles of the world, they're, they're on a different level and they, they, they have that, you know, the customer base has an idea and they're starting to distinguish between the two. It's not completely clear yet that they're different than us, right? In the fixed wireless world uh, of us wisps and stuff like that with the equipment that we use. So, so a lot of the problems that, that they see, you know, will translate into what potential customers of a wisp might think at the same time they're also helping right because in some areas where it's where it's working well you know and and people are on let's say an AT, AT&T LTE CPE at their house and they're getting good service and it happens to be working for them and stuff that's good advertising when they if they move out of let's say a city and go into a more rural area and there's a wireless operator out there like well that wireless thing worked you know pretty decent for me so so I mean it can help and hurt but uh, we have to make sure that we distinguish ourselves differently from the carriers out there with our technology, what we can do, the, you know, the, the services that we can provide, you know, and, and, and say, this is how we're different and really create, uh, that, you know, marketing message for ourselves because nobody else is going to do right. it. And, uh, th the first way you do it is with customer experience. Everything comes down to customer experience because word of mouth is king these days, you know? Yeah. And there's an interesting point that you're, you're raising about, the encroachment because we look at the we look at the um the growth because we're seeing the reports of you know how many hundreds of thousands of subscribers the big carriers are adding in fixed wireless and mm -hmm. it is not cutting into the majority of wisps like the majority right. of wisps so you know we we see how much our wisp customer base is is growing right we have that directly we know that directly and uh that's you know sure the 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 market is for fixed wireless in general is growing and taking away from some, uh, you know, DS, DSL and cable primarily doesn't usually take from fiber, but it's a situation where the, you know, the large carriers aren't doing rural in for the most part, they're doing, you know, they're doing more millowave, they're doing areas where that is, it's going to be cost effective because you're not having to, to run fiber, for example. And on the other side, on the extremely rural side, you're seeing some encroachment from Starlink. Yep. Starlink is also, if you look at their, they have actually put out a coverage map now, you know, with the number of satellites they've got up, they have so much spectrum reuse and they have uh, significant chunks of the country that are now fully saturated already until they can launch some more satellites, presumably. And so my, you know, my, my crystal ball uh, that I was gazing into a couple of years ago, I actually wrote a blog <laughs> post about this last year uh, where I said, you know, you wisps need to not be scared about Starlink because it's going to be amazing for the people in that, you know, that, one person per square mile, five persons per square mile, where guess what? It never was cost effective for WISPs to deploy. And so WISPs are gonna, I mean, I, I f honestly, I feel it's doing us a favor because one, it gets people used to wireless, but two, they're, getting, they're taking the customers that you don't want as a WISP. You can't make money off those customers, and so I, you know, maybe we're sandwiched in the middle here between the, the uh, you know, the, the mobile operators turned, turned fixed 
and you know uh, Le uh, Leo low Earth orbit on the on the low end. Uh, but I feel that really helps with actually just optimize, do the things we're doing best. That area where there is word of mouth, as you're saying, Tassos. Yeah, definitely. And I think over time, it's it's going to help us more than it's going to hurt us because I believe for, you know, uh, the majority of these customers, like you said, first, you know, they're ones that you never would reach or you couldn't uh, make it work in order to go out there because that's the kind of tower with an omni type deployment for that type of low density. But the other thing is, too, is I think from what I'm seeing from people, you know, is that they are stealing away the what I would call fireable customers, right? Those ones that are a pain in the ass, they're just going to leave you just because there's another option out there. And because, you know, they, 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 they think the grass is greener somewhere else, right? Exactly. So we're starting to see that already with, you know, somebody saying, yeah, I just picked up another Starlink customer or the Starlink co customer came back or whatever it is. It's just like, don't be scared of it. It's going to happen. Let them go. And uh, they'll, they'll come back home because once, once it gets saturated, they're going to realize that it's no different than, uh, you know, any of the other, you know, big box type things where, you know, when, when you reach out to the masses like that and you're signing up subscribers, you know, by the fistful, it's, it's hard to maintain that, you know, and, and like I said, you know, try, try getting tech support, you know, or something right. else to happen or, you know, call them up and complain that your D-Link isn't working or you're not getting the Wi-Fi out, you know, into your, you know, by your pool or whatever it is in your backyard and, and, and having them go through all that stuff. So it's just a matter of time. I mean, it is a great service. I'm, I'm glad they're doing yeah, it. Fantastic. You know, it, it it will, you know, all this competition is is always good, right? So if anything, I could see the positive of, you know, again, the the hardware manufacturers in this space trying to come up with a solution to combat it, right? And something that will allow people to go deeper uh, and push further with at least the decent speeds. You know, again, these hybrid networks that like you were talking about earlier, you know, people, you know, where, where they're, you know, they're combining channels together to get more bandwidth and do different things, and uh, you know, I I can see something. Like like this, you know, bringing 2.4 gigahertz back to the game again or something like that in some of these areas or these lower frequencies, just doing something interesting. Um, because again, e even in these really low dense areas, I mean, for them, you know, they would love to have a five meg package. You know, I, I was happy with the three meg package to at least be able to work from home and do a conference call or whatever. So there's, there's definitely a, a good, good market out there uh, for the WISP industry. It's going to take you know, the, the hardware manufacturers to come up with something that's viable for that low density install. Because up to now, it's all been about density. You see all the new equipment that's right. coming out. It's about customer subscribers, you know, pushing, you know, uh, hundreds of customers onto one AP in the widest area at the highest speeds, doing these amazing things, which probably won't do all those things at the same time. You know, it'll just do one or two of them. Um, but I think I think it would be awesome to see a manufacturer step up and, and take a step back and say, OK, how do we really now? Because we've we've changed the game. Right. Our, us Wisps have, you know, made, you know, rural America, you know, something viable. of what. You know, yeah, viable and, right. and something that is you would consider you'd see in the cities, right, or in the suburbs and stuff like that. So the, the, the map of rural America has to be redrawn because now what was rural America is no longer that, you know, in, in the broadband world. So right. I, I wish a manufacturer would step up and say, okay, now how do we go and get those, the, the real last mile guys that are out there and can't get anything else or satellite is the only option. How do we serve those those people? And, and I know like TV white space was one way of doing that. I think that's a, a lost uh, gamble, but yeah, lost uh, gamble. I, I, yeah, I think I think I think there's really something that still could be done. Uh, LTE, right, is one of those things. I think it's probably it. You know, costs are kind of high though uh, for that low density for some wisps as well. But uh, it's really going to be about frequency, and uh, it's going to take again education because you know those those areas are going to have to realize that you know you're not going to get the hundred meg package. You know, you're not going to get two hundred meg out there and, and huge uploads and stuff. It's going to be slower, but you're going to have connectivity, and over time. Things will get better and the technology will improve. But until somebody tries to really focus on that, you know, it's, it's not going to happen and satellite will dominate. So, yeah, that's a really good point. And, uh, you know, we're hearing a lot of buzz about Tirana, for example. They've got some amazing technology and it's really going yeah. to be suited for a fairly high, still fairly high density deployments. Uh, it's not going I to think replace. extremely high density. <laughs> well, it's, it's, yeah. 
we could argue that it, I imagine it has to do with what plans you want to serve on that too, and you sure. know, how much yeah, your, yeah. what your competitors are. But that's it's still true that there's a place for wisps. We've got you know I moved to the city back in 2018, moved to Anchorage here um, after having lived in the you know fairly rural area for 20 years, and all there was was there was a, a capped cable provider, very expensive. Uh, I think to to get an un, a truly unlimited connection was like 180 dollars a month, right? <sighs> Wow. And, yeah. uh, and, and I was like, I'm not going to pay that. <laughs> and, uh, the, the, uh, they're really, there, there was a, you know, one local wisp, but they, they didn't have coverage in this area, you know? So the fact that, you know, you really can with a, within a rural area where a, a wisp is really taking the initiative or sometimes multiple wisps, um, you can, you can really live, live life, um, in, in a way that still allows you to participate in modern society. And we're seeing yeah. this, this, you know, not just the move out of California and into Texas and into other states, but we're also seeing, uh, you know, continued push. Look, just look at the real estate markets, right? Uh, where people are, they say, no, I want to be able to work from home and I want that home to be uh, where I want it to be, right? Right. It's a continual, that frontier is still expanding, right? And it's going to expand for, America's got a lot of space, right? It's still going to continue to expand. So I'm uh, I'm very bullish about this uh, this industry. It's uh, It's been a really... A great ride. For a number of years, I, I didn't necessarily consider myself a WISP, even though I was using wireless technologies. Um, I didn't look like the traditional WISP. And, uh, you know, then eventually I started actually going to WISPA shows and realizing, oh, you know, actually, I do have some ways that I can give back to the community and things that I can learn from the community. And uh, it's it's really a, it's really a great, great industry to be part of. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that I'm kind of able to still, you know, it was, it was like the choice when I, when I moved to Prusim, is like I could stay at one, you know, fairly large uh, internet provider, um, uh, you know, large by WISP standards and, uh, you know, keep doing some good here. Or I can go work for a company uh, where I can help hundreds of WISPs and, you know, hundreds of thousands, of, you know, uh, of people. And it's uh, it's really been a, a great move, I think. Yeah, it's funny. There's some so many times we've gone through the the wisp industry is doomed. You know, we've had this conversation <laughs> sort of multiple times, and whether it's fiber, whether it's Starlink or LTE overrun or whatever it may be, and then just the the wisp industry continues to adapt. And there's never been a greater tool set available out there than you know this. Even especially with like what what you guys are doing now. I mean, you know, this was not an option ten years ago to get to that right. sort of granular level. So not to make this a big commercial spot but really like for those out there that are not familiar with Prasim and like the the sort of elevator pitch about what you do and how you do it you know we've mentioned bits and pieces but if you kind of give folks a, a general summary of what your main goal and missions are there and how you go about it I think it would really help a lot to shed some more light on about what you know you guys do in a company but what the industry as a whole is kind of moving towards as well absolutely yeah I, I'd be happy to do that um, we we are seeing some movement in the industry to our understanding the quality of experiences. I mean, I, th I, I think that we've been at the forefront of that, certainly in the fixed wireless space, but we're also seeing it in, in other, other spaces, you know, even the large carrier space where we've got operate, uh, not, uh, I'm sorry, vendors talking to us about this, um, uh, you know, this understanding that experience is king and you need to have a way to quantify it. So we essentially have a three uh, kind of three, three legs of the stool, if you will, at, at Preseme, where we want, first want you to help you understand, um, you know, what quality of experience is, and then how is, how is it actually, uh, you know, how is the customer experience uh, for each of your customers, right? And ideally help you optimize that. So we want you to understand it, we want you to be able to make it better, right? So the three legs are, uh, first, the uh, we want we, we measure latency and loss. So that's that's you know let's quantify this. Let's let's understand the things that affect the customer experience the most, right? And then the second one is optimize it, where we have a active queue management, which manages um, the the uh, the latency that a customer is experiencing, which as we've proven is the 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 biggest key factor in uh, making sure that you do have a good experience. Curiously, if you optimize for latency, it also increases your bandwidth. So you don't have to just say, let's turn up all the knobs on the bandwidth. Oh, actually, mm -hmm. if you optimize for latency, it does improve bandwidth. Uh, and then the, the third part is a deep understanding of the access layer. So right now, what we've been showing is uh, understanding the RF access layer, because that's the market that we started in first. Now, there's nothing 
specific about these techniques that I've been describing that is WISP only. Uh, it's just, you know, we've had the problem of trying to understand dynamic capacity, even just throughout the day capacity can change because of the environment. We're dealing with microwave, we're dealing with a shared medium. So the problem is like most acute in wireless, but it's not specific to wireless. And uh, we see that as our customers hybridize, uh, that's, a, that's a growing market as well, where there's a growing demand for the things that we do, uh, not just for for fixed wireless, but for other technologies. So look for that coming as well. So deep understanding of the access layer, how is it performing, uh, optimizing for latency, and then measuring the latency. Those are the three things that we do. And um, there isn't really anybody who competes with us uh, directly in that space. We do have um, we do have some people that uh, are considered to be our competitors, but uh, we're 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 really kind of setting this umbrella. What does quality of experience mean and what can you do about it? Our focus for market right now is on local and regional providers, which is what WISPs tend to be. We talked about some of these national providers. Uh, you know, I, I know they, they don't really yet come to the ship. They're not WISP members, right? They do their own <laughs> thing. They're kind of running different gear yeah. in some cases. Um, and we're not focusing on them. Uh, you know, obviously that that would be a large market, but uh, uh, that you know, our founders uh, really wanted to focus on the, the local and regional providers because they like the way that those companies do business. And uh, you know, you, you've probably met, the, met our, our management team. Uh, it's been a strategy that's uh, worked out really well for us. And we really, you know, we like it. We like it here in the WISP space. So, and it, WISPs are growing too. Uh, I think we'll, we'll still have that focus on being local and regional and, you know, being real members of our community, the communities that we that we live in and that we work in. You know, very often that's the case. You know, even with WISPs with tens of thousands of members, that's still a totally different story from an ISP with millions of customers that is this faceless conglomerate. So, um, yeah, that's what we've been doing. Very cool. And then uh, the other really cool stuff that we see from you guys are you do the annual fixed wireless report. You know, we, we all spend quite a bit of time digging through that. Uh, some of you guys give the community for free a um, ton of really useful information. And it's, I'm not going to say shocking, but there's definitely some things in there that are surprising. You're like, really? Okay. <laughs> so if you can kind of give uh, back to like, like, what's your mission, you know, providing that you have the data, obviously, and it's, it's right. very rare that a company that has data wants to give it away. Right. Because it's, you know, <laughs> it's my data. Oh, we're going to do, we're going to monetize <laughs> this, you know, <laughs> and, and hide under and, the, and the some bridge. Of that, yeah. Some of that data we, we do use, you know, some of the RF analysis features that we're talking about, that is an additional paid tier on the base product. That we've launched and uh, uh you know so yeah we can't give it all away for free but there's still a lot to come there's still more to come you know the stuff that we were showing at canwisp a, a couple of weeks ago is, is stuff that hasn't made into the report yet i'll give you another example of this would be like what's the plan distribution across you know for speeds we talk about this i've got to have this this pressure to have a 100 meg plan or the pressure to have a 150 meg plan and the you know i i, I want to say you're you're really dealing with um uh you know, there, there's um, about a third of WISPs right now are not offering 50 meg plans. So that's, you know, think of those as the, maybe the emerging WISP or the, you know, the, the, the ones where they, maybe their market isn't demanding it yet. Um, and then about a third uh, are offering 50 meg plans. And that's up to about 10% of their user base. So when you think of right now, it's still not the most popular plan, 50 meg plans or not. <clears throat> and then uh, there's about another third that have, um, you know, a very high percentage of 50 bank plans, right? So they're in a market where they're deal dealing with maybe at least half their uh, half their user base is on a 50 meg plan or better. And the interesting thing about that is that in general, WISPs that are serving 50 meg plans are actually delivering it. The reason that we were focusing on 50 for this particular analysis is because that's what the Canadians are dealing with from a funding perspective. But we could run this analysis, same thing on that, like that, that 120 plan that we talked about at the FCC. Um, you know, obviously not a lot of WISP offering that today, but, uh, but, but a few are. And what's interesting about the, the, those higher speed plans is it is absolutely about channel size and how many customers you're putting on it. It's not about can the gear do it, right? It's yep. does the operator engineer it correctly and do it right? We can, 
Like we've even seen some successful delivery of 50 meg plans on a 10 megahertz channel, but that's like to one or two users, right? <laughs> sure, <laughs> can sure. be done. So your your chances of delivering a 50 meg plan go up dramatically as your channel with a uh, channel with rises. Um, but we've seen we've seen um, quite a bit of success there. And what we define by success is delivering a plan that actually feels fast. So it's not about whether you can hit it on the speed test. It's does is the customer experience positive, uh, and because we we've seen this again and again. If you make that experience good, the customer has no reason to reach for a speed test. Absolutely, we we have a <clears throat> or I know a customer of Wisp in Arizona who doesn't sell speed plans, <laughs> right? I mean, his whole marketing is you know basically you tell us kind of, you know, what kind of uh, use you need or something like that, you know, and then you pay based on that need, but there's no guaranteed speed. All they guarantee is that you'll be able to stream three things, work from home, uh, do online thing and whatever, or I want to game or whatever. So you'll pay more and basically has it, you know, fairly open, somewhat managed and stuff like that. But I mean, he, he, he's, he, he can't keep up with the, the amount of subscribers that are coming to him and that they want this service. And he also, I believe he's doing like no annual contracts either. It's just like, come on board. And, and, and the people come and they stay, you know, cause he's charging right. a, a decent price for it, you know, so it's not outrageous. And, and, uh, you know, he's doing the job of kind of teaching his customer base that it's not about speeds. Trust me, you'll, you, you know, you, you use way less and just sign up with our service. And basically, they, again, they, they pay based on how much they say they want to use, so to speak. It's uncapped, unlimited, right. all that stuff. And, you know, when it's not being used, you know, they could they can get 100, 200 meg or whatever it is because they're the only ones really utilizing it at that time. But, you know, he guarantees that you'll be able to, again, stream this many things at the same time, you know, play your game and do this, you know, at, at this particular, you know, price point. So yeah, I mean, that, that, that kind of works. <laughs> That's a really good way to, to, uh, to do it. If you can, if you can educate your customer base, uh, absolutely. We, I was moderating a discussion um, at Wisp America last month in New Orleans, and we were talking about managing oversubscription because this is, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of the hard problem that you're dealing with. The issue is not what's the peak speed, but it's like, how oversubscribed is this? And uh, one of the operators said, you know, I, 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 was, I was saying, you know, you all of you are, are selling an implicit oversubscription ratio to your customers by how much you load up your sectors, right? And one of the operators said, no, I make that oversubscription ratio explicit. And I engineer to that. And that's actually very healthy. It sounds like that's what your friend is doing, right? That's a very yeah. healthy way to do it, to say, okay, now here's, here's what you should expect rather than, promise them the moon right now and then as they load it up people start getting less and less you know that's that way uh you know you're not managing customer expectations correctly and eventually they're going to be unhappy and my feeling yep. is and this is this is part of you know we we think of this behind every new feature that we're dealing with at preseam is does it put you further ahead in that ball game of being, you know, or, or you know, hockey, the skating to where the puck is, right? Like we, we want, we want you to be ahead of it because by the time the customer actually has a complaint, you've, you've lost their heart, right? You've lost their soul. Yeah. And, and then, you know, it's all about efficiency too. Like we mentioned about it's, it's about putting the right subscribers on there. So a wisp should have a minimum signal level, you know, and if it goes above that, they don't bring on that customer. They should have a maximum user count per radio, right. And not go above that. And a lot of them are just like, well, he's got signal he's in here. So now, you know, they, they load it up and now everybody suffers while he's like oh shit what do i do now now he's got to re-engineer it he's got to put up more antennas more radios switch these people over and if he was just if he planned it right he would have said hey there's you know nothing available right now to a new customer because you want to keep everybody you have happy and says you know in about a month we'll be able to bring you on and he knows he has to go up there he's got to split that sector or whatever he's got to do right to add more capacity and then bring on happy customers and keep them as happy customers because yeah. you know uh, again a lot of wisps they, they make that mistake they're like well he gets signal at 10 miles away uh, you know he's it's right. only a 20 meg it's only a 20 meg plan and i have a 4x connection you know so it's going to deliver it but that 4x connection just ruins it for everybody else that's on there exactly and that's why, why we brought out the new scores because you now, now you can see empirically here's how much they're ruining it i do want to yeah. Not, That's awesome. not direct us, but to say, well, the you know, we, we don't actually even give you a, a ranking on the basis of your signal level in pre -seam. We do it entirely based on modulation. 
Because as you know, there's a number of factors that yeah. go into that. So yes, yeah. it's good to have a minimum uh, that you know, that's a, a great first step. I would go one step further and say, not just a minimum signal level, but a minimum modulation. This is what you've Absolutely. got to be hitting because you have to preserve the, the that airtime. That's that's your most precious resource. And we've talked about this before, like your installers have the biggest uh, control. They, they have this ability to ruin your business if you're not careful, <laughs> right? They do. They, well, and- if you're like, if you're pressuring them to make the install, yeah, 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 they're, they're gonna, gonna make it. that call. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and if you're, no, you're right. That's are incentivizing them to keep the value in the network. Then sometimes there will be customers that you say, "No, I, I you know, we, it's a failure." Yeah, yeah. That, that's a great way to. That was a great way to clarify clarify that point. And you're you're absolutely right because I've I've had people in with saying, "Well, you know, I, I got a a neg forty connection, you know, and and the spec sheet says, you know, that I should have, you know, eight x or ten x, whatever it is, and I'm not getting it, you know. But you know, it's it's less than sixty, so they sign it up, and it's a very good clarification point that you made there. Yes, modulation rate is definitely more important than signal strength. <laughs> So we don't even measure it. Uh, you know, we don't even we, we report it. Like we'll show you the graphs and stuff for it, but we don't even pay attention to it. It's just not necessary uh, for the types of analysis that we're doing. Where you just need to say, how does it actually run? Mm-hmm. Like that's what we need to know. Like, is it does it chooch? As I say, like yeah. is, it, is it happy? <laughs> right? uh, and and then and is it stable too? Because you're looking, we're looking at it over a fairly long period of time. You know, you don't take action on the basis of uh, of one little dip you know every day there's this thermal curve that's going on mm-hmm. right so uh it, it does require some some number crunching to make that happen but uh, uh that's 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 why we are a big cloud product because there's a lot of number crunching that goes on and not just to produce those reports but but every day yeah we're, we're building that a statistical profile um uh, of that real world data that's coming in because we we collect trillions of records a day and uh <sighs> It's it's a fun. I love the big data side. You know, I started my first my first. I was thinking back to like my first like quote programming job, um, or you know the first thing I did that was commercial. And I was twelve, and I built an inventory database at twelve, and uh, I didn't know that you know just. I was playing around with databases. I had other data data jobs in my teens, and then of course I did some e-commerce. Uh, you know, I think I was nineteen or twenty, and was doing that. You know, that everybody was getting into e-commerce back then, right? Yep. Let's build a website and sell some stuff. <laughs> uh, and that all that data uh, database experience would come in handy later on when like all these threads converged. You know the the Wisp experience and the you know the the expertise at Preseem and it's it's been a lot of fun to um, to build some stuff that's uh, um, that's changing people's lives in in a real positive way. And uh, and of course we got. To, the team has grown at, at Preseam considerably as well to enable us to do that. So yeah, there's a lot, a lot more development time that's gone into the the recent stuff than than went into the original product. It's just really fun. Now we're starting to see some uh, other players within the industry also moving to the sort of QoE space, which uh, could be a little spicy. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> uh, there's a, there's some differentiators. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's there's people doing TCP acceleration. That's not something we will ever do. We 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 think that actually makes the problem worse of preserving airtime. Like when, from an ROI perspective, oh, that doesn't seem to make sense to us. Um, and you know, there's people doing deep packet inspection, for example, where they say, hey, oh, I want to know how much Netflix is going on on my network. Uh, or maybe you're trying to make decisions about peering points, and you want to know. Um, you know exactly what's going on from a CDN perspective, and that's not something we'll ever do at Preseam uh, in that way. You know, the the founders came from Sandvine, which was the all about deep packet inspection and shaping, and uh, you know we're se- you know selling those services to you know Comcast and to the you know the biggest providers in the space, uh, and and they don't want a repeat of that. It's a it's a losing battle because the 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 the, the, um, the the content manufacturers, if you will, the the the, the services on the internet are continually coming up with more ways to distribute and to encrypt. And eventually it's all encrypted and all distributed. And you really can't differentiate it very, very intelligently without a great deal of effort. So we don't do those things. And uh, if, the, if there's an operator who needs that for some reason, you know, I, I've heard um, maybe one cogently argue that they <laughs> actually needed to have a uh, deep back <laughs> inspection in order to be able to, to limit say they wanted to cap all their Netflix rates at four mags. In general, most operators we see don't need that. They don't, they just, they don't, they are not differentiating what their customers are doing. They're staying very net neutral, but let's say that you have a commercial customer and the commercial customer needs you to do a particular type of shaping. Um, 
and you, even if it's residential, you could do that. Then there's a, there's a space for that, but uh, we don't see the majority of people needing anything like that. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I mean, we could probably sit here and talk all day. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, any any sort of number of topics and, and tangents and stuff like that. But um, are there any sort of other hot points you want to make? Any topics you want to kind of go over? Anything specific about Prasim or you or anything like that you'd like to uh, expand upon as you have this venue here? Awesome. Uh, just you know, it's it's been great to see uh, the Wisp community, uh, you know, develop an online presence. Basically, I only have a Facebook account, so I can be on Wisp Talk, the, the Facebook group. <laughs> I don't really use it for much else. Um, I don't post a, a ton, but I, I'll, I'll I'll chime in on occasion there, and uh, it's really great to connect with our friends. Definitely, if you do get to the Wisp shows like Wisp Palooza or Wisp America, um, you know, come and say hi, introduce yourself. Um, I can be found. Uh, I'm Jeremy at preseam.com if you want to uh, send me an email. And of course, uh, please check out our website. You know, we've got full information there about, you know, pricing and uh, what the features and benefits are. And uh, you, can, you can definitely reach out to us uh, if any of this strikes your, strikes your fancy and takes your interest. Amazing, amazing stuff, man. My, I'm still, mine is still blown when you said that you're collecting like a, a trillion records a day or something. <laughs> Like that is well just, over that. It's, yeah. yeah, it's 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 amazing what uh, you guys are doing and just the amount of uh, data that uh, you have to crunch and do. And uh, like I said, I, I hear nothing but good things. You know uh, what you guys are doing for the industry, and it and it's and and I'm I'm happy that you guys are around. Uh, to do this stuff because uh, you're really, you know, helping Wisp figure out what uh, what they're doing wrong, what they could do better, um, and and help them become more efficient again. Because yeah, you know, efficiency is a big big part of this, um, especially in in the wireless world. I mean, you know, things are somewhat almost you know limitless when it comes to you know wired or optical you know type connections, um, because airtime is not as uh, not a thing, <laughs> you know. So so you guys are doing a good thing, and 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 I'm I'm happy for that and uh i'm glad that you're a part of this industry part of wispa and all those things that uh, are helping grow this industry for sure oh yeah thank you for mentioning that as well i do want to give one more plug which is that yeah. i chair the education committee at wispa which is as much about educating our internal members about you know new new technology that's coming down the pike uh, uh a lot of the regulatory stuff goes through through um uh, you know through wispa where they produce webinars for their members but also to get the word out we talked about how this is a customer education problem um for the for the world uh at large to understand hey wisps really are a viable option um it's a volunteer committee if anybody wants to um to kind of help us with our mission which is you know help people understand the good that Wisp is doing. I would. And, I do. I do. Hey, okay. Uh, I'll get you hooked up. But yeah, just drop me an yeah. email. And uh, we, we meet for once a month uh, for, an, for usually half an hour or maybe an hour, usually pretty short. And uh, we help advise Wispa. We help pr uh, produce webinars. We do uh, whatever we, we care about. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we're doing, or help support, I should say, is the um, Women of Wispa Initiative is to help educate women to understand, hey, there are women operators, there are women technologists, there are women engineers who maybe were less visible at WISPA before. Uh, that's real exciting. We had our first meeting in WISP America uh, of that group. Uh, so that's kind of one of the little the offshoots of the education committee that we're going to help support them in any way that we can. So um, I'll be just anybody who's, who's interested in, uh, you know, letting the world know what a great job WISPs are doing, as well as letting WISPs know, here's the, we, we don't have to, we're not dealing with like the commercial side of uh, like what WISPA is doing for you so much. We've right. got, a, there's great staff at WISPA who are, are good at that. This is more like about what's happening in the community and what's happening in the technology space as well. Much stuff like this, uh, your, your podcast, for example, very educational to us. I look back at some of those episodes. Hopefully people got some value out of this one too. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. For sure, for sure. So, all right. Well, I think it's time to wrap this one up. Toss us, where can people find us if they're looking for us? Yeah, you could find us anywhere on social media. Facebook, Instagram is two great places to uh, find us on Wisp Talk, Wisp Picks, all the Wisp related Facebook groups online. Of course, you can find a lot of information about us at our website, rfelements.com. Great resource out there. We put a lot of time and energy into putting all the information to the most commonly asked questions. You could pretty much find that stuff on our website. And of course, the educational side of things, our YouTube 
channel. So if you go to youtube.com slash RF Elements, you'll find all of our podcasts that we're recording here, our Inside Wireless uh, video series, which is a great informational series, not just to help you gain a little bit more knowledge about the complex things, about how RF works and all those things, but also maybe help educate your newer guys, right? Your installers and stuff. We kind of break it down, all the individual topics about wireless into kind of layman's terms and easy ways to understand how this stuff works so it helps you do your job better. And then, of course, you can find us at our forum, rfelab.com, or just email us, tassos at rfelements.com, caleb at rfelements.com. All right. Well, Jeremy, again, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. This has been great. I think a lot of people will find a lot of value from this. So, Caleb and Tassos, uh, we're out. So, until next time, everyone, y'all be good. And a blast. Bye. Y'all be good. Bye.